When people find out I'm a religious, two things immediately happen. First, I am asked, what order? Second, what is your charism? The answer to the first question is easy, Salvatorian. Answering the second question takes a little more effort. The short answer is universality. The longer answer is that the Salvatorians, founded by Father Francis Jordan in Rome in 1881, followed John 17.3 as a foundational text. And eternal life is this, to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Combining a desire to make the universality of Christ's message known with an ability to discern the signs of the times leads to our commitment to proclaim the message to all people, everywhere, and at all times, and to do this through whatever ways and means the love of Christ inspires. Such a universal charism is very vocation-centered, for all ways and means denotes all kinds of people. Our acceptance and encouragement of diversity is itself universal, for regardless of ethnic background, sexual orientation, gender, or ecclesiastical status. All authentic seekers of the will of God are welcome to engage in ministry alongside us in whatever capacity they can. Because of this, we represent very different perspectives from traditional to progressive, even while engaged in the same types of ministries in the same city. Specifically, I focus on the Salvatorian parishes of Mother of Good Counsel and St. Pius X, parishes in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, both representing our charismatic universality. The Salvatorians have been in Wisconsin since 1896, when Milwaukee Archbishop Frederick Katzer gave the society control over extensive lands at St. Nazian's in Manitowoc County. St. Nazian's was founded in 1854 by a German priest named Ambrose Oschwald, whose vision of a German-language Catholic utopia would have found a sympathetic audience in Katzer. In the late 19th century, the Archbishop was a conservative force in a brewing controversy known as Americanism. Pope Leo XIII defined Americanism in Testem Benevolentiae as having three heterodox tendencies. Excessive accommodationism, a spirit of religious subjectivism, and a new form of ecclesiastical nationalism. Katzer saw Oshwald's vision as a stronghold against such heresies. And though it was becoming clear the Oshwald community was not going to remain indefinitely viable after his death in 1873, Katzer was unwilling to let it fail. He would either salvage at least part of what it had meant, or find a way to continue its apostolic work. The Salvatorians having a German founder is undoubtedly why Katzer believed they were best suited to carry on St. Nazian's. Jordan was born in Gertbeil during the Kulturkampf and managed to become a priest and found his order in Rome. He was a good conservative German and St. Nazian's would be safe under his order's care. Language definitely tied into Katzer's decision. And while liberals such as Bishop John Ireland of St. Paul, Minnesota, saw immigrant identity and languages as transitional elements toward rapid cultural and linguistic assimilation, Katzer stood with New York Archbishop Michael Corrigan, whose conservatism encouraged immigrants to retain their culture and language. Katzer's 
culturally preservationist views that Catholicism was a bulwark against modernity and secularism informed his decision to grant control of the community to this new order. How Katzer learned of Jordan and the Salvatorians in the first place reads like a study in divine providence. Three sisters from the society opened a new foundation in Milwaukee, and their superior, Sister Raffaella Bonheim, befriended a neighboring pastor named Father Ludwig Barth. Having attended the Oshwald Community Seminary in 1872, Barth remained closely associated with it. Getting to know the sisters, he also learned about Father Jordan's desire to found a Salvatorian house of men in the United States. Barth knew the Oshwald community was declining and thought St. Nazian's was a perfect foundation upon which Jordan could build. After visiting the community with Father Barth, Sister Raffaella wrote to Jordan on March 8, 1896, exhorting him to come and see the possibilities for himself. In the meantime, Barth had also informed his archbishop about the Salvatorians, and Jordan was in correspondence with both men. Incredibly, Katzer also wrote Jordan on March 8, 1896, inviting the Salvatorians to assume leadership. Katzer's involvement proved fruitful. Though the original meaning of St. Nazian's changed, the apostolic work continued when it became a minor seminary in 1909 that educated many priests for the Salvatorians and the Archdiocese. Building on the Oshwald Foundation as Barth hoped they would, the Society also operated a successful publishing department that pioneered the use of direct mail a method commonly used by religious communities even now, as well as selling a popular periodical called Manna. This historical context shows that Salvatorian universality was already apparent at the root. While Jordan's land grant and Salvatorian usage of it as a minor seminary come from a tradition-minded perspective, Pioneering the use of direct mail and releasing a periodical that included stories, jokes, and iconography shows a zeal for progressive innovation. As the young Salvatorian province flourished, Milwaukee Archbishop Sebastian Mesmer invited the community to found a new parish in 1926. This invitation resulted in Mother of Good Counsel located near the Holy Cross Cemetery at the intersection of Burley Road and Lisbon Avenue. Apparently due to its Milwaukee location and proximity to archdiocesan activity, the society tested the site as a provincial headquarters and information house. St. Nazian's was ultimately deemed more appropriate, however, particularly since their on-site novitiate was better suited to directly receive candidates from the minor seminary. As we can see, the old Provincial Headquarters Information House remains standing even now. The first pastor of Mother of Good Counsel was Father Willibald Unger, who lived from 1887 to 1948. He received a building in 1926 that served as both church and school for Catholics who were moving into that undeveloped part of the city. Unger later developed another multi-purpose building on site, which contained the church itself, as well as eight classrooms on two floors. Further development took place under the 13-year pastorate of Father Paul Schuster, who lived from 1903 to 1962, and who added a new wing to this school that had four classrooms, a cafeteria, and a gymnasium. This expansion accommodated more than 600 families, and Schuster entertained further architectural plans for a new church building and rectory. After his election as provincial superior in 1953, Schuster's final decision for Mother of Good Counsel was appointing Father Joe Dirks as pastor. I now turn to his remarkably lengthy 30-year tenure, for it was Dirks's personalities and the ministries under his watch that formed Mother of Good Counsel into the traditional pole 
of Salvatorian universality that it became. In holding up Dirks as traditional, I do not mean him to be seen as a negative stereotype. Sometimes when we think of traditional people, rigid caricatures come to mind. We may think of a strict Monsignor standing bolt upright and clicking a clacker to which we are to kneel with metronomic precision, or the smacks our knuckles once endured from an angry Sister Kunigunda's ruler. Dirks, however, was so beloved that he was removed from the St. Nazian's teaching faculty in 1945 because of his popularity among the students. Administrators deemed him a distraction and consequently moved him to Milwaukee, where he began serving at Mother of Good Counsel. Under his watch in 1958, a new rectory was built that included living space, rooms for the community, and a house chapel. The crowning achievement of Dirks's pastorate came relatively early in his tenure. In 1966, he broke ground for the construction of a new church, which Archbishop William Cousins dedicated on December 8th of the same year. While Dirks and his parish saw the construction of a new church as a capstone accomplishment, that does not mean they were inwardly oriented to the point of being static in doing ministry. For Dirks, a beautiful, viable infrastructure reflected and complemented the spiritual health of a congregation, and he thus remained dedicated to ministries that promoted Catholic action, such as the Holy Name Society, Christian Mothers, and St. Vincent de Paul. The pledge Holy Name Society members took to forego profanity and the slogan Every man a holy name man provided a strong sense of identity that informed ministry. Christian Mothers was also popular at Mother of Good Counsel, with members serving as assisting room mothers in the school who could also be called on to help in various ways at the parish. In going out to people and meeting their food, clothing, and housing needs in confidentiality, the St. Vincent de Paul Society also did God's own work. The Society remains active at the parish to this day. One might point out that in the midst of post-Vatican II enthusiasm, prioritizing a new church building showed a tendency to turn inward and preserve what is already there, rather than first looking outward and addressing the needs in the larger community. However, this completely misses the point of what Dirks was trying to accomplish. He wanted a beautiful church for the community to love. And he supported organizations like the Holy Name Society, Christian Mothers, and St. Vincent de Paul Society so people could have a strong sense of belonging while doing the right kinds of things for people. Father Joe himself was a good worker with a pastoral heart who was always the first one to roll up his sleeves and do whatever was needed. An excellent example of meeting a need was how he dealt with difficult requests. Former provincial of the Salvatorian Sisters, Sister Carol Thresher, recalled her early days teaching grade school at Mother of Good Counsel. And what happened when the Lake Franciscan Sisters needed help teaching a large group of troubled students. I was teaching fourth grade in my first year of teaching, and St. Emilians had a whole population of young boys who were placed there by the court and who came out of very, very difficult situations. They were kids who were taken out of abusive settings with their parents. The Lake Franciscan sisters ran it, and they were the mothers and teachers of that school. And they tried to mainstream kids as they got stronger. They didn't just want to send them anywhere, so they asked around. And Father Joe was the first one to say, Of course, of course they can come here. There's no question. These were pretty disturbed kids, and I ended up with two of them in my classroom. And it was a challenge to work with them and to work with St. Emilian's. 
But it was, I think, very inclusive, very Salvatorian to say, we don't close our doors against these kids. Dirks's parochial benevolence held up very well until the Second Vatican Council, which asked pastors to do things for which their backgrounds had not prepared them. A telling example was the parish council, which did not interest Dirks in the least. But he was in an archdiocese where Archbishop Cousins had created the Office of the Laity in 1968, which specifically called for parish councils. Dirks had none of it. He was the pastor, and he felt he already had enough people involved. He did consult with others that he chose as a sort of kitchen cabinet of people with good standing in the community. But there was nothing like an elected parish council or any sort of distribution of responsibilities with committees. While certain changes, such as vernacular languages, were unavoidable, Father Joe generally resisted implementing conciliar recommendations. For example, communion under both species was not done under his pastorate. An historical overview of Mother of Good Counsel Parish shows a traditional approach to leadership and ministry. Where discerning and acting upon the signs of the times meant sustaining a 1950s parochial model. Yet regardless of Father Joe Dirks's personal ideology, Mother of Good Counsel was perfectly willing to open its doors and do ministry to interested and needy people. It demonstrated Salvatorian universality, even though it did not show the same progressivism demonstrated by St. Pius X Parish across town. St. Pius X Parish was an offshoot of Mother of Good Counsel, though it began life as the Gridley Dairy. It had already been abandoned for some time when Paul Schuster discovered it. Seeing it as an ideal site for a new parish, he wanted to start by 1944. However, the provincial superior at the time, Father Bede Friedrich, would not sign off on the purchase. Unflappable in his expansionist zeal, Schuster convinced a parish group known as the Don Bosco Foundation to buy the site with money they had acquired through various fundraisers. Their desire, however, which Schuster embraced, was to found the Don Bosco Youth Center, which was intended as a Catholic alternative to the YMCA. Out of this context, a parish finally emerged after Archbishop Moses Kiley talked Schuster out of the youth center, insisting that Mother of Good Counsel was becoming too big, both in the parish and school. In light of Pope Pius X's concurrent canonization, Kylie wanted Milwaukee to have one of the first parishes in the world named after the new saint. And so St. Pius X Parish was founded with its first mass celebrated on August 15th 1952. Progressive leadership at St. Pius X was not immediately evident, but built gradually over the first three pastors. The first pastor was Father Leander Schneider, who lived from 1912 to 1980, and who served from 1952 until heart problems caused him to relinquish the pastorate in 1968. Schneider was succeeded by Father Raphael Beringer, and who, unlike Dirks, his counterpart, was completely on board with conciliar recommendations. Beringer gained a reputation for zealously organizing Vatican II-inspired parish councils and became an in-demand speaker across the archdiocese. In implementing the signs of the times in this way, Beringer both exceeded Dirks's willingness to do so, and promoted St. Pius X as a place where something new could happen. The extent of this newness was further felt in 1976, when Father Luke MacArthur 
who lived from 1925 to 1999, assumed the pastorate. Through his fierce and unwavering commitment to social justice ministry, St. Pius X was formed into a progressive embodiment of Salvatorian universality. With a background as a paratrooper, drama teacher, and street preacher for years in the South, who was completely on board with the conciliar reforms implemented in American Catholicism between 1964 and 1970, MacArthur was a force of nature. As a priest, he was indelibly marked by Vatican II and felt compelled to enact social justice wherever he believed it to be necessary. No aspect of parish life was exempt from his designs. Desiring lay participation in the liturgy, he celebrated birthdays, publicly welcomed new members, incorporated spontaneity, drama, and audience participation into how he presided, even using popular folk music at Mass. His homilies unrelentingly exhorted people to become socially conscious, and no topics appeared to be off limits. He denounced the racial exclusivity of St. Pius X's Wawatosa neighborhood, always prioritized concern for the poor, and was unafraid to dissent from both government and church policies. Because of this, activist groups such as Dignity, an early LGBTQ plus ministry, held masses at St. Pius X until Archbishop Rembert Weakland told them to stop. There is no doubt that MacArthur was outspoken, but he was also kind, pastoral, and authentic. He practiced what he preached, and his rectory was open to anyone. If you needed some place to stay, it did not matter if you were a difficult confrere or a Central American refugee. MacArthur would be as hospitable as Dirks was with a difficult student, and all were welcome. A running joke around the provincialate during the pastorates of Joe Dirks and Luke MacArthur was that they represented the sure sign of Salvatorian universality. It would be difficult to imagine two more different personalities, and yet they were both in the same community doing the same types of ministry in the same city through very different ways and means. But now that we have examined both parishes historically, what is to be said about their current roles? Do their ministries and leadership styles still render each one recognizable? Mother of Good Counsel is more or less recognizable. It still has an ongoing relationship with the St. Vincent de Paul Society, although the parish school has become a choice school with an almost completely African-American student body. The most significant continuity Mother of Good Counsel experiences might well be the absence of Joe Dirks. According to United States Provincial Archivist Father Mike Hoffman, many of the people who were at MGC, even today, still psychically think of Father Joe as pastor, even though he's gone to his heavenly reward. In their mind, the parish that Joe had was the parish that they would still like to exist. Mother of Good Counsel remains traditional. Between the old guard remnant and the younger people now living in the neighborhood, the parish's future is open-ended. Looking across town, St. Pius X Parish is still very progressive. In terms of ministries, the parish continues in MacArthur's willingness to house refugees. Other ministries include Living Waters, which builds wells in Tanzania. In 2016, they raised $27,000, which built five wells. Local Milwaukee food pantries and meal programs are being supported. And parish educational programs include immigration, consumerism, and checking one's ecological footprint. 
Ultimately, this progressivism is contextualized in St. Pius X Parish being founded in the midst of Catholic action, especially in how the era witnessed a shift in balance between lay people and the clergy. Observable through ministries such as the Catholic worker, nascent progressivism was already in place prior to Vatican II. The council first served as a launching pad for Beringer's parish councils, and then especially for MacArthur's lay involvement in social justice ministries. These factors all combined to solidify the parish as a progressive expression of Salvatorian universality. And this charism continues today under their pastor, Father Paul Portland. Though he is in the progressive camp, he is not an in-your-face firebrand like MacArthur. Father Paul's style, albeit competent and thorough, is very relationship-centered. He is constantly stretching himself and helping people in many different ways and is more interested in connecting with them than telling them what to do. So, what about the future of these two parishes? The waters get murky here, for change itself has changed. Our formerly confident ideologies and the halls within which proclaim them represent a cultural stability that no longer exists. Barring the rise of Latino Catholics to whom we owe the life we still have, there are simply not enough Euro-Americans going to Mass anymore. Because of this, and in light of the new normal of parishes merging into clusters, long-standing parish cultures are now relegated to diocesan and religious archivists to catalog. Add immigration and Spanish language ministry to this new paradigm, and all we really know is that we are navigating through chaos in the hope of creating new and sustainable order. Do the current Mother of Good Counsel and St. Pius X clusters, respectively St. Sebastian's and St. Catherine's and St. Bernard and Christ King, provide new stability? that can maintain some sort of recognizable continuity with Salvatorian universality? For as long as Salvatorians are involved with each parish, probably. But entering into the future of mystery without necessarily knowing how things are likely to go is itself Salvatorian. For our mission is to proclaim the message to all people, everywhere and at all times, through whatever ways and means the love of Christ inspires. This can manifest through multiple ministries, even at the hands of personnel who are not yet among us. Knowing what to do in advance and whether or not it will work are not prerequisites. The Salvatorian charism lives on in Mother of Good Counsel and St. Pius X parishes. Regardless of what their futures may hold, their traditional and progressive approaches still demonstrate Salvatorian universality. And to be universal is to be both and. By this I mean there is room for both the parishes of Joe Dirks and of Luke MacArthur, for they not only represent Salvatorian universality, but also the whole traditional, progressive, liberal, conservative dynamic overall in the Roman Catholic Church worldwide. If the spiritual needs of the community are being met, if they are equipped to do relevant ministry, and provided there are no flagrant heresies proclaimed, it is simply a matter of discerning where one is most authentically at home. God can be universal anywhere he wants. As a Salvatorian, the one thing that matters is to discern perpetually how to best implement tradition and progress so that both are relevant and effective. Overall, our mission is to live a universality that seeks to understand and act on the signs of the times.